guys. Welcome back to chapter two of Rave Reads, or Read with Rave, or whatever we decide we're going to end up calling this. Um, we left off after we had read the first chapter of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, uh, which was the first book in the Harry Potter series. I hope that everybody that watched along or read along with me enjoyed the first chapter. Um, we are going to keep reading through that one and see how it goes. Um, I might have a couple surprises in store for when we get a little further into the series. So just stick with me if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, we are going to read the second chapter of Harry Potter today. So if you have your copy, uh, please get it out so you can read along with me. Otherwise, get on those listening ears and let's have a read. So chapter two was called The Vanishing Glass. Nearly 10 years had passed since the Dursleys had woken up to find their new nephew on the front step, but Privet Drive had hardly changed at all. The sun rose on the same tidy front gardens and lit up the brass number four on the Dursleys' front door. It crept into their living room, which was almost exactly the same as it had been the night that Mr. Dursley had seen that fateful news report about the owls. Only the photographs on the mantelpiece really showed how much time had passed. Ten years ago, there had been lots of pictures of what looked like a large pink beach ball wearing different colored bonnets. But Dudley Dursley was no longer a baby, and now the photographs showed a large blonde boy riding his first bicycle on a carousel at the fair, playing computer games with his father, being hugged and kissed by his mother. The room held no sign that another boy lived in the house, too. Yet, Harry Potter was still there, asleep at the moment, but not for long. His Aunt Petunia was awake, and that her shrill voice made up the first noise of the day. Get up now, Harry woke with a start. His aunt rapped on the door again. Up, oh, she screeched. Harry heard her walking toward the kitchen, and then the sound of the frying pan being put on the stove. He rolled onto his back and tried to remember the dream he had been having. It had been a good one. There had been a flying motorcycle in it. He had a funny feeling that he'd had the same dream before. His aunt was back outside the door. Are you up yet? She demanded. Nearly, said Harry. Well, get a move on. I want you to look after the bacon and don't you dare let it burn. I want everything perfect for Duddy on Duddy's birthday. Harry groaned. What did you say? His aunt snapped through the door. Nothing, nothing. Dudley's birthday. How could you have forgotten? Harry got slowly out of bed and started looking for socks. He found a pair under his bed, and after pulling a spider out of one of them, he put them on. Harry was used to spiders because the cupboard under the stairs was full of them, and that was where he slept. When he was dressed, he went out to the hall in the kitchen. The table was almost hidden beneath all Dudley's birthday presents. It looked as though Dudley had gotten a new computer he wanted, not to mention the second television and the racing bike. Exactly why Dudley wanted a racing bike was a mystery to Harry as Dudley was very fat and hated exercise. Unless, of course, it involved punching somebody. Dudley's favorite punching bag was Harry. He couldn't often catch him. Harry didn't look it, but he was very fast. Perhaps it had something to do with living in a dark cupboard, but Harry had always been small and skinny for his age. He looked even smaller and skinnier than he really was because all he had to wear were the old clothes of Dudley's. Dudley was about four times bigger than he was. Harry had a thin face, knobby knees, black hair, and bright green eyes. He wore round glasses held together with a lot of scotch tape because all of the times Dudley had punched him on the nose. The only thing Harry liked about his own appearance was a very thin scar on his forehead that was shaped like a bolt of lightning. He had it as long as he could remember, and the question he could ever remember asking his aunt Petunia was how he got it. In the car crash when your parents died, she said, and don't ask a lot of questions. Don't ask questions. That was the first rule for a quiet life with the Dursleys. Uncle Vernon entered the kitchen as Harry was turning over the bacon. Comb your hair, he barked by way of a morning greeting. Uh, about once a week, Uncle Vernon looked over the top of his newspaper and shouted that Harry needed a haircut. Harry must have had more haircuts than the rest of the boys in his class put together, but it made no difference. His hair simply grew that way all over the place. Harry was frying eggs by the time Dudley arrived in the kitchen with his mother. Dudley looked a lot like Uncle Vernon. He had a large pink face, not much of a neck, small, watery blue eyes, and thick blonde hair that lay smoothly on his thick, fat head. Aunt Petunia said that Dudley looked like a baby angel. Harry often said that Dudley looked like a pig in a wig. Harry put the plates of egg and bacon on the table, which were difficult as there wasn't much room. 
Dudley, meanwhile, was counting his presence, his face fell. 36, he said, looking up at his mother and father. That's two less than last year. Darling, you haven't counted Aunt Marge's present. See, it's here under the big one from Mommy and Daddy. All right, 37 then, said Dudley, going red in the face. Harry, who could see a huge Dudley tantrum coming, began wolfing down his bacon as fast as possible in case Dudley turned over the table. Aunt Petunia obviously sensed danger too. Sensed danger too, because she said quickly, and we'll buy you another two presents when we're out today. How's that, Popkin? Two more presents. Is that all right? Dudley thought for a moment and looked. It looks like hard work. Dudley said slowly, so I'll have 30, 30, 39, sweetums, Aunt Petunia said. Oh, Dudley sat down heavily and grabbed at the nearest parcel. All right, then. Uncle Vernon chuckled. Little Tyke wants his money's worth, just like his father. Atta boy, Dudley. He ruffled Dudley's hair. At that moment, the telephone rang, and Aunt Petunia went to answer it while Harry and Uncle Vernon watched Dudley unwrap the racing bike, a video camera, a remote control airplane, 16 new computer games, a VCR. He was ripping the paper off of a gold wrist watch when Aunt Petunia came back on the telephone looking angry. Bad news, Vernon. Mrs. Figg's broken her leg. She can't take him. She jerked her head in Harry's direction. Dudley's mouth fell open in horror. But Harry's heart gave a leap. Every year on Dudley's birthday, his parents took him and a friend out for the day to adventure parks, hamburger restaurants, or the movies. Every year, Harry was left behind with Mrs. Fig, the old, mad old lady who lived two streets away. Harry hated it there. The whole house smelled of cabbage, and Mrs. Fig made him look at all the photographs of cats she's ever owned. Now what? said Aunt Petunia, looking furiously at Harry as though he'd planned this. Harry knew he ought to feel sorry that Mrs. Fig had broken her leg, but it wasn't easy when he reminded himself it would be a whole year before he had to look at Tibbles, Snowy, Mr. Falls, and Tufty again. We could phone Marge, Uncle Vernon suggested. Don't be silly, Vernon. She hates the boy. The Dursleys often spoke about Harry like this, as though he wasn't there, or rather, as though he was something very nasty that couldn't understand them like a slug. Well, what about what's her name? Your friend Yvonne? On vacation, Aunt Petunia snapped. You could just leave me here, Harry put in hope, and in hopefully he'd be able to watch what he wanted on television for a change and maybe even have a go on Dudley's computer. Aunt Petunia looked as though she'd swallowed a lemon and come back to find the house in ruins, she snarled. I won't blow up the house, said Harry, but they weren't listening. I suppose we could take him to the zoo, Aunt Petunia said slowly, and leave him in the car. The car's new. He's not sitting in it alone. Dudley began to cry loudly. In fact, he wasn't crying. It had been years since he actually cried. But what, But he knew that if he screwed up his face and wailed, his mother would give him anything he wanted. Dinkily Dudley Dums, don't cry. Mommy won't let him spoil your special day. She cried, flinging her arms around him. I don't want him to come. Dudley yelled between huge pretend sobs. He always spoils everything. He shot Harry a nasty grin through the gape of his mother's arm. Just then, the doorbell rang. Oh, good lord, they're here, Aunt Petunia, said Aunt Petunia frantically. And a moment later, Dudley's best friend, Pierce Folkses, walked in with his mother. Pierce was a scrawny boy with a face like a rat, and he usually the one who held people's arms behind their backs while Dudley hit them. Dudley stopped pretending to cry at once. Half an hour later, Harry wouldn't, couldn't believe his luck. He was sitting in the back of the Dursley's car with Pierce and Dudley on the way to the zoo for the first time in his life. His aunt and uncle hadn't been able to think of anything else to do with him, but before they left, Uncle Vernon had taken Harry aside. I'm warning you, he said, putting his large purple face right up against Harry's. I'm warning you now, boy, any funny business, anything at all, and you'll be in the cupboard from now till Christmas. I'm not going to do anything, said Harry, honestly. But Uncle Vernon, Vernon didn't believe him. No one ever did. The problem was, strange things often happened around Harry, and it was no good telling the Dursleys that he didn't make them happen. Once, Petunia, tired of Harry coming back from the barber, looking as though he hadn't had a haircut at all, taking a pair of scissors and cut his hair so short he was almost bald, except for his bangs, which she left to hide that horrible scar. Dudley laughed himself silly at Harry, who'd spent sleepless nights imagining the school the next day. 
where he was already laughed at for his baggy clothes and his taped glasses. Next morning, however, he had gotten up to find his hair exactly as it had been a week before Petunia had sheared it off. He'd been given a week in his cupboard for this, even though he'd tried to explain that he couldn't explain how it had grown back so quickly. Another time, Aunt Petunia had been trying to force him in a revolting old sweater of Dudley's, brown with orange puffballs. The harder she tried to pull it over his head, the smaller it seemed to become, until finally it might have fit a hand puppet, but certainly wouldn't fit Harry. Aunt Petunia had decided it must have shrunk in the wash. To his great relief, Harry wasn't punished. On the other hand, he'd gotten into trouble for being fond, found on the roof of the school kitchens. All these gang had been chasing him as usual when, as much to Harry's surprise as anyone else's, there he was, sitting on the chimney. The Dursleys had received an angry letter from Harry's headmistress telling them Harry had been climbing school buildings. But all he'd tried to do, as he shouted at Uncle Vernon through the locked door of his cupboard, was jump behind the big trash cans outside the kitchen doors. Harry supposed that the wind must have caught him mid-jump. But today, nothing was going to go wrong. It was even worth being with Dudley and Pierce to spend the day somewhere that wasn't school, his cupboard, or Mrs. Figg's cabbage-smelling living room. While he drove, Uncle Vernon complained to Aunt Petunia. He liked to complain about things. People at work, Harry, the council, Harry, the bank, Harry, just a few of his favorite subjects. This morning, it was motorcycles. Roaring along like maniacs, the young hoodlums, he said, um, as a motorcycle overtook them. I had a dream about a motorcycle, said Harry, remembering suddenly. It was flying. Uncle Vernon nearly crashed into the car in front of him. He turned right around in his seat and yelled at Harry, his face like a gigantic beat with a mustache. Motorcycles don't fly. Dudley and Pierce sniggered. I know they don't, said Harry. It was only a dream. But... He'd wished he hadn't said anything. If there was one thing the Dursleys hated even more than his asking questions, it was his talking about anything, acting in a way it shouldn't. No matter if it was a dream or even a cartoon, they seemed to think they might get dangerous ideas. In the very sunny Saturday, the zoo was crowded with families. The Dursleys brought Dudley and Pierce large chocolate ice creams at the entrance, and then, because the smiling lady in the van had asked Harry what he wanted before they could hurry him away, they bought him a cheap lemon ice pop. It wasn't bad either, Harry thought, looking at it as they watched. A gorilla scratching his head, which looked remarkably like Dudley, except it wasn't blonde. Harry had the best morning he'd had in a long time. He was careful to walk a little way apart from the Dursleys so that Dudley and Pierce, who were starting to get bored by the animals by lunchtime, wouldn't fall back into their favorite hobby of hitting him. They ate in the zoo restaurant, and when Dur Dudley had a tantrum because his knicker rocker glory didn't have enough ice cream on top. Uncle Vernon brought him another one, and Harry was allowed to finish the first. Harry felt afterwards that he should have known it was all too good to last. After lunch, they went to the reptile house. It was cool and dark in there, with lit windows all along the walls. Behind the glass, all sorts of lizards and snakes were crawling and slithering over bits of wood and stone. Dudley and Pierce wanted to see huge poisonous cobras and thick man-crushing pythons. Dudley quickly found the largest snake in the place. It could have wrapped his body twice around Uncle Vernon's car and crushed it in a track like a trash can, but at the moment, it didn't look in the mood. In fact, it was fast asleep. Dudley stood with his nose pressed against the glass, staring at the glistening brown coils. Make it move, he whined at his father. Uncle Vernon tapped on the glass, but the snake didn't budge. Do it again, Dudley ordered. Uncle Vernon rapped on the glass smartly with his knuckles, but the snake just snoozed on. This is boring, Dudley moaned. He shuffled away. Harry moved from the front of the tank and looked intently on the snake. He wouldn't have been surprised if it had died if he had died of boredom itself. No company except stupid people drumming their fingers on the grill at glass, trying to disturb it all day long. It was worse than having a cupboard as a bedroom, where the only visitor was Aunt Petunia hammering on the door to wake you up. At least he got to visit the rest of the house. The snake suddenly opened its beady eyes slowly. Very slowly, it raised its head until its eyes were on level with Harry's. It winked. Harry stared, and he looked quickly around to see if anyone was watching. They weren't. He looked back at the snake and winked, too. The snake jerked his head towards Uncle Vernon and Dudley and raised its eyes to the ceiling. It gave Harry a look that said quite plainly, I get that all the time. I know, Harry murmured through the glass, though he wasn't sure the snake could hear him. It must be really annoying. The snake nodded vigorously. 
that's really cool having a snake be able to respond to you. Do you think that you would like if snakes were able to respond to you? What animal would you talk to if you could talk to any of the animals that you'd like? I talk to the giraffes. I like giraffes a lot. Where do you come from anyway, Harry asked. The snake jabbed its tail at a little sign next to the glass. Harry peered at it, boa constrictor, Brazil. Was it nice there? Boa constrictor jabbed its tail at the sign again and Harry read on. This, this specimen was bred in the zoo. Oh, I see. So you've never been to Brazil. As the snake shook its head, a deafening shout behind Harry had made both of them jump. Dudley, Mr. Dursley, come and look at this snake. You won't believe what it's doing. Dudley came waddling toward them as fast as he could. Out of the way, you, he said, punching Harry in the ribs. Caught by surprise, Harry fell hard on the concrete floor. What came happened next? What came next happened so fast that no one saw how it happened. One second, Pierce and Dudley were leaning right up close to the glass. The next, they had leapt back with howls of horror. Harry sat up and gasped. The glass front of the boa constrictor's tank had vanished. The great snake was uncoiling itself rapidly, slithering onto the floor. People throughout the reptile house screamed and started running for the exits. As the snake slid swiftly past him, Harry could have sworn a low hissing voice said, Brazil, here I come. Thanks, amigo. Mm -hmm. But the keeper of the reptile house was in shock. But the glass, he kept saying, where did the glass go? The zoo director himself made Aunt Petunia a cup of strong, sweet tea while he apologized over and over again. Pierce and Dudley could only gibber. As far as Harry had seen, the snake hadn't done anything except snap playfully at their heels as it passed. And by the time they were all back in Uncle Vernon's car, Dudley was telling them how it had nearly bitten his leg off while Pierce was swearing it had tried to squeeze him to death. But worst of all, for Harry at least, was Pierce claiming, calming down enough to say, Harry was talking to it, weren't you, Harry? Uncle Vernon waited until Pierce was safely out of the house before starting on Harry. He was so angry, he could hardly speak. He managed to say, go, cupboard, stay, no meals. Before he collapsed in his chair, and Aunt Petunia had run to get him a large brandy. Harry laid in his cupboard much later, wishing he had a watch. He didn't know what time it was, and he couldn't be sure the Dursleys were asleep yet. Until they were, he couldn't risk sneaking to the kitchen for some food. He lived with the Dursleys almost 10 years, 10 miserable years, as long as he could remember, ever since he'd been a baby and his parents died in that car crash, he couldn't remember being in the car with his parents had died. Sometimes, when he strained his memory during long hours in his cupboard, he came up with a strange vision, a blinding flash of green light and a burning pain on his forehead. This, he supposed, was the crash, though he couldn't imagine where all the green light came from. He couldn't remember his parents at all. His aunt and uncle never spoke of them, and of course, he was forbidden to ask any questions. There were no photographs of them in the house. When he had been younger, Harry dreamed and dreamed of some unknown relation coming to take him away, but it never happened. The Dursleys were his only family. Do you ever wish that you could be taken away from your family? Where do you think you would go? What type of people would you hang out with if you could just be anywhere? I think I like my family quite a lot and I wouldn't want to be separated from them. Yet, sometimes he thought, or maybe he hoped, that strangers in the street seemed to know him. Very strange strangers they were, too. A tiny man in a red velvet top, violet top, hat, had bowed at him once while he was out shopping with Aunt Petunia and Dudley. After asking Harry furiously if he knew the man, Aunt Petunia had rushed them out of the shop without buying anything. A wild-looking old man dressed in a all green had waved merrily at him once on a bus. The bald man had a very long purple coat and actually shaken his hand on the street the other day and walked away without a word. The weirdest thing about all these people was that they seemed to vanish the second Harry tried to get a closer look. At school, Harry had no one. Everyone knew that the Dudley's gang hated old Harry Potter and his baggy old clothes and his broken glasses, and no one liked to disagree with Dudley's gang. So what do we think about this chapter? Is there anything that we'd like to talk about? What do we know about that snake? So we use a um, literary device called personification. When we're talking about the snake, we're giving it human-like characteristics that it wouldn't often have. Snakes do not typically wink, and nor do they talk, but 
We assumed that the, the snake had talked to Harry and said that he was off to Brazil. So we're personifying that snake. We're giving him person characteristics. What yeah. other things do you think we would like to have human characteristics? What would you like to talk to if you could talk to anything uh, like you do your friends? Well, we'll be back soon with chapter three, the letters from no one. If you enjoy the Harry Potter series, uh, leave me some notes to tell me that you're watching. Um, and I hope to have another one out for you guys super soon. Bye guys.